All right. Well, great to be here again to talk about EV5, talk about U.S. real estate, South African real estate. And we are joined today by the president and CEO of Real Estate Magazine, Neil Peterson, uh, who previously was a guest uh, here with us, and uh, Sonia Clark, who heads up our efforts in South Africa. I'm Manuel Ortiz, the uh, Vice President of Global Business Development for First Pathway Partners. And uh, Neil, it's great to have you again. You, Your track record, your experience, you've interviewed former President Trump, have some great uh, publications. And so maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started. No, thank you very much, Manuel. It's, it's absolutely wonderful being here again today. And by the way, it looks um, like you're you're uh, reaching us from the CNN control room over there. It's a really nice background <laughs> that you have. <laughs> I've actually been to the CNN studio in Atlanta, actually. So oh, nice! Exactly what you're talking about. So maybe I've got my inspiration <laughs> from them. <laughs> <laughs> Great. The, well, Manuel, thank you, thank you. Um, it's absolutely wonderful having uh, you know being here and. Uh, and yeah, it's just been, you know, it's wonderful, you know, the whole EB5 program, it's a great chat you, that we can get into, um, you know, a lot of moving parts, <clears throat> a lot of things that uh, people need to consider. But, um, you know, working with you guys, I've seen you've really got a, a great product there. And and yeah, so to a little bit about myself. So um, um, I run a real estate publication. We do events. Uh, we essentially communicate uh, to uh, mainly South African investors, but you know, mainly also African investors. But we've got a big following in the US. We also got a big following in in the UK and those kind of markets because uh, it's a digital. It's REI REI dot co dot za. Um, that's a website that we're on and we've been around since 2007. And uh, so we report up to date, keep people up to date, where to invest, how to invest in real estate. Um, we've, we've managed to bring a number of investors to the US from South Africa to buy US real estate. That was probably about seven, eight, nine years ago. So I'm familiar with the markets and yes, it's just great being on the show. Thank you very much for the invitation, Manuel. Yo, thank you so much. Truly appreciate it. And, and Sonia, if you want to talk a little bit about your background with First Pathway Partners, uh, you head up our uh, South African efforts and just have an outstanding uh, track record experience in working with uh, people and trying to achieve the American dream through our projects. Absolutely. Thank you, Manuel. And thank you, Neil. Uh, always great to see you and speak to you. What a wonderful human being. Um, and also very knowledgeable. So thank you so much. Um, yes, so my track record goes back starting in real estate, going into banking, and then getting involved with all the uh, international chambers of commerce. And in 2010, um, I was invited by an immigration attorney to start getting involved in EB5. So yes, I've been uh, through a lot of the changes, a lot of the reauthorization of EB5. And yes, dealt with various South African families that uh, want to immigrate to the United States. We had a short lapse, as you know, waiting for the reauthorization. You know, one or two of our investors landed up in the UK waiting. But uh, eventually, you know, as of I think it was the end of last year, beginning of this year, those authorizations started coming through. So, yes, very happy to be involved in EB5. Very interesting industry is always changing and there's a lot of players and a lot of information out there so i think it's just important for investors just to get the right information and it's a good start with us yes no thank you so much for that and maybe we can get started and uh, start our discussions with just talking about just real estate in general and what's happening with real estate in the south african market and, and neil you're there on the ground and, and seeing what's happening there with real estate, maybe if you give us a little background of some of the things that you're seeing. I know you're in an election year, so that that's yes. something that is uh, different. And then also, you know, from what I've been able to read as well, is that there seems to be a lot of um, social issues, political issues that are also impacting the, the market. But it does also seem that you know once you get past election, things might be turning a little bit. And so maybe if you could add a little bit of insight as to what's happening there. Absolutely, yeah. No. Um, so yes, so the, the South African property market, as we would call it, is you know for the last I would say ten, twelve years has really been chugging along. It hasn't really probably been 
performing as as it should do. Um, and a number of reasons for that. I mean, you know, South Africa being a you know a lot smaller than you know the US. Um, I mean, we typically the size of one of your smaller states. So it's, <laughs> um, and you know, so that's kind of the size of our you know you know our economy. So, but but the market, I think, it's still it has a lot of beauty, has a lot of other things going for it in certain areas, a lot of minerals and all that kind of stuff. So in terms of real estate, it's it's it varies from obviously area to area. We've got nine what we call provinces, and you would call states, and uh, and it, it varies from each one of them. Where I come from, it's Western Cape. It's uh, it's by far the best performing area. I mean, and the reason is because you know our municipalities have been failing dismally, but really dismally in the other eight um provinces which has affected property prices it's affected the property market and it's also caused the mass migration of people moving on to better services uh into to the western cape area for example and uh, so all the outlying areas have benefited because of this migration very similar to what happens in the u.s where people like to go from colder states like you know new york state and they go to the south, like, you know, states like Arizona. Um, but this one is slightly different. This is definitely not weather. This is services which are offered by our government, which is not, in, it's inferior services. So what's happened is that in the Western Cape, you see that there's massive demand for, for rental accommodation. It's not uncommon to find 25 people queuing for one property, you know, to, to kind of, you know, access one property. And uh, so, so yeah, so that's that's a big, big sort of game changer. And I think if, if you look at the Western Cape versus the other nine or other eight provinces, it's a bit of an anomaly. You can't really look at the market over and just say South Africa. You've got to look at Western Cape and sort of pull it apart. So it's slightly different. And it has, you know, it's close to the sea. It uh, has wine farms, a tropical type uh, you know, climate, you know, we, we now in, in our autumn, which you would call the fall. And uh, so certainly, you know, very different. But but if you look at pricing, I mean, the you know, the, the market could have performed a lot better if things weren't managed that well. I mean, I think the average home price in the US is something like 495,000 US dollars. And I mean, in the dollar equivalent in South Africa, you're probably looking at a at $140,000, you know, so it's, it's just to kind of just give you like a, a comparative term in, in US dollar terms. And if you look over a period of time, you'd see the US market has certainly outperformed South Africa more, but it's very different. You know, everything is bricks and mortar in most cases, but we notice that properties certainly in the last 10 years are getting smaller. So if you want to get an apartment or even a condo or whatever you, you call it in the US, apartment condo, we would call a flat or a um, masonette or even, you know, a townhouse type, type, type of part. We've seen that they're all getting very smaller. So the space is starting to run out. So, so yeah, so there's, there's a lot of pros and cons, you know, and if we had to sort of go into the US market, you can't just talk about one state, you need to talk about all of them because there's some really, really powerful markets in the u.s doing exceptionally well and there's those that are not doing so well and there's all you've got to really find the dynamics and get to understand what is driving the pricing so just as an introduction that's kind of what's going on. i don't know if you want me to elaborate a little bit more but but certainly i think it's 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 we're hoping this election we get a new government we, we've run this country for 30 years because it's it impacts our daily lives certainly in terms of municipal services Thank you for that. That's that's great background. And maybe if, if you and Sonia can elaborate a little bit, and Sonia, if you're working with uh, South African families on, on, on a daily basis, but maybe we could get a sense for, in, in the U.S., it's going to be a little bit different, and, and I'll talk about, you know, what's happening with interest rates and those things, but maybe if, if both of you can give me a sense, and Sonia, please go ahead and start with how South African families are, are, are feeling um, relative to the value of real estate, I think, right in 
for example, in the U.S., what you're hearing is, okay, real estate is still very expensive. Rent is very high and those things. But, you know, from what Neil was saying right now, um, that a lot of the feeling that South Africans have are the is the service aspect of things. But maybe if you could talk a little bit just about value and, and, and those things. Sure, no problem. So, um, you know, just coming to mind is a particular investor that we had, um, you know, up in, in Johannesburg, in Stain City, and they were trying for two years to sell their property. And in those two years, um, it became increasingly basically impossible to get their price. So, you know, we finding in Johannesburg, particularly that property prices uh, have dropped dramatically. Um, you know, and, and as Neil says, the services aren't there, uh, you know, just driving around Johannesburg, uh, to give an idea, you know, the, the roads are not being repaired. Um, the water is a major problem. Neil will know about that as well. And, and the other South Africans. So it's really just the, uh, current government. I think the frustrations coming in with everybody that, um, you know, water infrastructure is crumbling. Um, and yes, the municipalities, you know, they, they're they not delivering the services. And of course, we've got the ESCOM problem. And, um, you know, just, just looking at the at the um, general trend, you know, they call it the CAP exit, where a lot of uh, uh, Joe Burgers, as we call them, uh, you know, people from Gauteng, they are moving to, to the Western Cape. And, um, you know, it, it's a different world, it's a different country, uh, literally on its own, you know, everything works. Um, you know, their roads are immaculate. I mean, you go through Cape Town city center and everything is clean. Um, you've got that whole European feel. There's a lot of international uh, property owners there as well, which is also driving property prices up uh, in Cape Town. But all in all, um, a lot of people in Joburg are feeling, you know, because the rates and taxes are, are so high. Um, just for services, you know, they'd much rather sell their homes and rent something, you know, so they don't have the headache at the end of the day, you know, to fix their properties and to pay those high rates. So in comparison, you know, a, a lot of the investors that we're talking to and have spoken to in the past, not even lately, I mean, just going back five years, um, a lot of them are selling up their homes and assets and some of them businesses and investing their rands into the US dollar because it's a lot more stable. And um, yeah, so I think I think more or less, um, uh, you know, talking about the one investor that you and I've been working on as well, they call it multifamily homes or investments. So it's like mm. sexual title on our side. And, you know, those are outperforming properties in South Africa. So for those that that are looking at hedging against the dollar, I think a lot of people are looking at selling up, and um, yes, most definitely investing into um, you know international real estate, you know, and particularly the United States real estate. So yes, Neil, are are, are there any insights that you want to add to some of the things that Sonia mentioned? Yeah, yeah. So so I absolutely concur. Look, obviously, as you mentioned, there's a, a big exit out from from up north, and 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 I think what's happened with the South African RAND in particular is it's devalued significantly over the last 10 to 12 years. So a lot of people have diversified their wealth, whether it's in investment or whether it's in real estate, or, and they've actually moved their wealth out of the country. There's a significant, I, I don't have the number, it's, it, but it's a it's in the trillion RANDs, uh, so, which is it's minuscule in US dollars. So it's in the billions of the dollars. But we don't know how many billions, but it's certainly a big number that's exited and it's parked in other jurisdictions around the world, including the US. The US is still the dollar that you know currency that people tend to trade with and that kind of thing. And yeah, look, the, the real estate markets are, are very different because while the municipal services are falling apart in South Africa. A lot of people that live up north, up in Johannesburg, certainly where Sonia comes from, live in an estate. So generally, the estate is run and managed, and you know, run by the the state operator. The and and normally the services within that estate is okay. But if you don't have electricity, <clears throat> that's a little bit of a problem. Or if you don't have water, and I think that's the basic services. If you speak to <laughs> Sonia, she will tell you they've actually run out of water. So the, the equivalent, uh, so so the equivalent of the uh, single family home would be a freehold property, 
Um, the section or title would be more, uh, Sonia, very similar to, I would say, the apartment type living. And uh, they also have homeowners associations as well in the US because uh, I've worked with quite a lot. So freehold would be a, a standalone property like a single family home, for example. And I think where South Africa is different. It's sort of in, in an estate environment, whether it's a golf estate or whether it's other you know, it doesn't have to question a state or something like that. So you find that to be slightly, slightly different. So, so there are people living in bubbles <laughs> within, you mentioned Stain City yeah. as well there, uh, Sonia, which is probably mm. the leading, you know, property development in South Africa by a, a country mile, you know, so certainly I think, uh, and it's, it, I mean, it has a lot of all the fancy stuff over there. So if you had to compare in U.S. terms and you had to buy the equivalent in U.S., you, you would have to pay significantly more. But you are in a U.S. dollar in a very powerful currency. So that's what you got to understand. So diversification of wealth is a big thing. And uh, and uh, I think I mentioned <clears throat> earlier, excuse me, um, about taking investors. I mean, we took about 100 investors to the U.S. in 2012. Um, and to Atlanta area in particular, I mean, houses, free, free, you know, single family homes were selling for, I think, between eighty dollars and $140,000. And now we I think they're more in the two fifty plus dollars. So everybody made their money, first of all, just on the capital growth. But secondly, they also made it on the currency because the currency at that time was seven to one. And today it's now, well, it's almost 20. So it's like, you know, which is crazy. So so there's a double whammy for South Africans over there where they made their money, one on the currency, two on the capital growth, which is a significant return. Well, I think both of you bring up some some really good points and, and how this this pertains to, to EB-5 and, and, and why it's important it is that also your EB-5 motivations around the world can be different but a lot of it is tied by one thing, and that's achieving the American dream. And 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 what does that actually mean? And and I think that you know some of the issues that you've mentioned um, that with what's happening in South Africa with some of the basic services, um, you know what's happening with real estate there, where you know the values can be quite lower than than what you're seeing in the U.S. I think that. You know, one of the motivations for for people to look at EB five, and just really quickly for those of, of you that aren't aware of the EB five program, that EB five program was created by the U.S. government back in 1990 as a way to spur economic development in the U.S. and it allows for the applicant, the spouse, and unmarried children under the age of 21 to obtain permanent U.S. residency. And so what's interesting is that it's a migration product through investment in uh, U.S., primarily real estate, but you can also invest in, in, in different types of things as well. But real estate really has been the tried and true um, form of investment for the EB-5 program just because of some of the requirements that EB-5 allows. But I think just to keep, keep things very simple, it allows the family to obtain U.S. residency. And sometimes you see people from different countries want EB-5 because their children want to study in the U.S. And they want to give them the ability to be able to come to university, study here, and with a U.S. residency, be able to work wherever they want. When you come with a student visa and you graduate, you have to find sponsorship and most corporations aren't sponsoring anymore. And even if they are, you basically have a lottery system where I think maybe even like a, two years ago, there were 700,000 applications or something like that. Uh, and only 14 to 15% uh, went through. So it really is a lottery. Um, and so you can imagine if you're an international student that finishes in the top 5% worked extremely hard to be at the top of the class and then you graduate and now you can't find a job because somebody isn't sponsoring you. Well, the through the EB-5 program, you can work wherever you want and not have to depend on only the corporations that are sponsoring. So there's a, a big value there. And other times, you know, people just want to migrate to the U.S. because of things that are happening in their home country, whether it's security, whether it's social uh, economical issues and those sorts of things. So it does open a new pathway for families to migrate to the US. I think you both bring something 
up that is, is really important and actually very interesting about the EB-5 program when you're talking about the value of money, because I mentioned that it's an investment. Uh, and sometimes when investors think of investment, the first thing that they think of is, okay, what are the returns going to be? Um, yeah. But I would say that in the time you mentioned your trip to Atlanta, right? And how, um, you know, when you got in at that time, the 140000 value of a house, that value, is specific, specifically in that market, which is one of the hottest markets in the U.S., is significantly more than that now. And I would say it's 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 more it's more than double. But I would wow. say that an EB-5 investment um, also should be looked at as a conservation of, of, of could be looked at as a conservation of capital play. Right. Because if, if you're investing, the investment amount is eight hundred thousand dollars. And if you're investing eight hundred thousand uh, dollars in a uh, investment product for EV five, your returns aren't going to be as, as high typically. Right. Higher return, higher risk. So it's going to be conservative. But you're at least going to be invested in a U.S. real estate product that more than likely will be able to hold its value in the event that your home country has some form of a devaluation. And I think that's something that you've seen, Sonia, with some of the families that, that you've uh, worked in, maybe that invested back in 2017, 2018, and you look at with what's happened, you know, they've been able to conserve the value of, of, of their money through those investments. Not saying that that always happens, but that is one of the benefits that, that could happen. Maybe if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so, Neil, I can't remember uh, back 2017, 2018, I think the rand to the dollar was 16, and then it started climbing towards 17 at that stage. So, um, and also uh, at one stage, the EB-5 program was $500,000, and then I had to get reauthorized, and the Senate then increased it because EB-5 hadn't been increased for a significant amount of years, increased it to $800,000. And um, I think the, the 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 most important thing that one has to remember is to get in early because, you know, if your oldest child uh, or your your only child turns 21, you'd have to do another EB-5 uh, for, for that child. And I think those that, are, that got in early, it was a really great thing. Um, you know, just going back, reflecting on the investor from Stan City, unfortunately, uh, what happened is because he couldn't sell his property, um, not that he didn't have the funds, but I mean, that was the top of funds. Um, his daughter turned 21 in the process. So, um, you know, I mean, we were looking, she had months to go and we were hoping and praying that they'd sell their property. But at the end of the day, um, yes, we had COVID in between, but at least, you know what, at the end of the day, their funds were safe, they were secure. The projects, uh, you know, obviously I think we're going to get to that later. You know, you got to look at the, your investment of the company that you're investing through. And I mean, FPP has got a hundred percent success rate. So, um, you know, investors knew, look, they, their money's safe. Um, you know, construction began again and life continued and tourism just went through the roof because, um, you know, everybody wanted to get out of their homes. They were locked down and everything became, let's get closer to nature. And I, and I think, you know, just, just having a look at our at our projects that we have and our new project, that's exactly, you know, sort of where we're looking at and where tourism's booming, et cetera, et cetera. But, but the idea is, you know, um, we don't know where the RAND's going to go to. Listen to people like Darby wrote and some of the economists. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually quite scary, you know, what they're predicting the RAND to go to. So, um, yes, I would say if it's possible, uh, hedge against the RAND, but you're also going to find it very difficult right now, um, you know, to get your reserve bank clearance and your funds out the country. I think that is that is a major issue um, also to consider. So, yeah. Um, and also, if I may say, um, we've got some recent investors um, now that there's been changes in EB-5, they want to get to the US a lot sooner. Uh, you know, a birth of a child, for instance, or, you know, just fear of what's going to be happening post-elections. Um, you know, we look at the areas and, you know, in January, you know, so to say, um, you know, those investors started talking to us. And we have the capability now of offering a rural project, which we'll get into a little bit later, which really does fast track your EB-5, you know, with uh, expedited processing. But uh, yes, I'm talking too much now. I'm getting ahead of myself. Thanks, Manuel. 
No, not at all. I think this was, you brought up some really good points and I think you touched on track record and first pathways track record. And, you know, like I would just say that the important thing is for us, we have a hundred percent track record in investors obtaining their their permanent green cards as, as you mentioned. I think that's really important. And if you want to understand the mechanics of EB-5 without getting into too much detail, you know, basically it, it comes down to no different than the transactions that that you would see, Neil, where let's say Sonia wants to build a hotel and it's going to cost her $20 million. Um, she has her equity. Let's say she has $5 million of, of her equity to invest into the project, but she still needs to get $15 million. And so that $15 million, she would come to First Pathway Partners and we would act just like a lender and we would have $15 million to lend to her, just like a normal lender would, right? This would be just be more of a private lending um, structure where we would provide, you know, perhaps a senior loan for $15 million. And Sonia would put in her $5 million of equity and that would complete the cost of the project. And we would loan it out over a period of years. Typically the time frame is going to be uh, four to six years. And, you know, when the project is over, investors then get their capital back. Um, there is a return component there. But in a nutshell, that's basically the way that the EB-5 investment uh, part of it works. I would say that as, as investors, it's always very important to understand that EB-5 has two independent processes moving in parallel. So you just think through two timelines. One timeline is going to be the immigration process, which you would have to work with an experienced immigration attorney to be able to document your case for the US government. And then on the other side, you have the actual investment of your $800,000 that um, we would aggregate in a fund and loan it out to the uh, developer over a period of time. They would be paying interest just like a normal loan. Um, and, and that's the way that EB-5 works. So you just think about it that way. Sometimes the investment timeline can tie uh, exactly to what the immigration process is. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, and so I think those are the questions that as you have discussions with uh, Sonia and, and myself that we'll be able to provide more details on, but that's typically the way that, that EB-5 works. And that's why we feel that, you know, it's a very powerful tool because it also is an investment. But, you know, the important thing is that it does open the pathway for your family to be able to establish their business in the U.S. You know, we're working with some uh, in, investors now, Sonia, that are looking to expand their South African businesses in the U.S. Um, other families that we've talked to are just looking at this as an investment uh, tool for their children so they can study in the U.S. and give them the freedom to decide whether they want to stay here uh, in the U.S. after they graduate or not, or at least give them the choice to, to do something like that. Um, and so I think, you know, it's a very uh, powerful tool, but I think the most important thing is, is to be able to conduct your due diligence on the people and the companies that you're investing with, because that's been really important. And maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, Mr. Kraft and uh, our founder and, and his role at IUSA and just our track record. Sure. So um, as Manuel said, we've got a 100% success rate uh, on green card issuance. Mr. Bob Croft is one of the most incredible human beings, um, a leader in EV5, a, a leader in actually upscaling, uh, well, upscaling downtown Milwaukee, you know, where our head office is. And Mr. Kraft was uh, elected president of IIUSA, which is invest in the USA. And our competitors actually voted for Mr. Kraft, um, you know, so, and Mr. Kraft also spearheaded, you know, the reform of the EB-5 program to, to protect investors and to make sure the integrity of the projects are intact. And um, also, you know, with USCIS, um, you know, certain filings had to be done. Um, anyone in foreign countries, you know, that's a promoter of EB-5 has to be registered and approved by USCIS. And I think those are probably one of the most important um, considerations, you know, when, when you look at investing as well. So not just the track record, um, you know, how long has the uh, regional center been operational? You know, some regional centers, there's new ones coming in all the time. Um, you know, you got to look at their projects, what kind of projects have they completed in the past, um, successful projects. And yes, I would say most certainly 
I'm very proud to be part of First Pathway Partners, um, you know, obviously because Mr. Croft is our, uh, uh, is our CEO um, and gives a lot of guidance, you know, in terms of uh, the industry and things like that. So, yes, I think our investors can be rest assured uh, in terms of our knowledge, you know, on EB5 and what investors need to look out for, um, you know, what not to do and kind of when they do their due diligence processes, you know, they we educate our investors. So they know exactly when they're investing to their, into their EB5 uh, project exactly what they're investing into and you know it's a service we provide we're available 24 7 um you know we we look after the investor throughout the process um because i'm based in south africa um i'm available 24 7 so you don't have to wait seven hours or whatever it, you know amount of time it is to be able to get hold of anybody in the us and i think it places us in a very unique situation you know uh with having uh, myself as a regional director for First Pathway Partners in South Africa. And of course, we get uh, many investors also not just from here, but also across Africa. And uh, yes, we gladly assist anybody, you know, um, come ask us any questions. We're available on WhatsApp. And um, so, yes, is there anything else that I've missed, Manuel? <laughs> no, I think you, you did a, a great job. It's really about the people. The EB-5 program is, is a long process. I mentioned it can be four to six years on the investment side, on the immigration side. You know, right now, one of the exciting things is that processing times are a lot faster than what they have been in the past. So, you know, that process could potentially be uh, quicker or or just the same as the uh, in investment process. So I think... You know, those things are really important, but it's just important to invest with uh, people that you have a good feel for their track record and that are transparent. Because, you know, one of the things in, uh, and again, without getting into too much detail about project structure and, and those things, we can talk about that um, as you reach out to us individually. But I think that the project structures can get uh, quite sophisticated. And, as a, and the example that I gave was where, you know, if uh, Sony is building a hotel, costs $20 million, you know, she's investing $5 million of her own money and we're loaning out 15 million. Typically that's going to be what's called a senior loan where we have uh, the EV5 investors have first priority of repayment. So if the project doesn't work out, um, Sonia is in the riskiest position with her $5 million. Uh, and then keep in mind that that $20 million is the cost of the project. Once it's built out, the, the thought there is that there's an appreciation value. There's a value there after something is built. People, if it's a hotel, people are actually staying there. You have cash flows and now the value is going to be more than $20 million. Maybe it's 30 or $40 million later, right? Um, but as the senior lender, you know, once this loan matures, we're concerned with getting our $15 million back, right? And so there the EB-5 investors are in the first position. And so they're project it's projected to be a conservative structure because you're in a senior loan position. Um, and so that's what that's uh, referred to. But I think it's important that as you're conducting your due diligence, obviously you want to do your due diligence on the companies that you're investing with, but on the project level, it's really important to understand the investment structure that you're actually in. Sometimes, you know, there's, there's a thought that, hey, we need another bank involved in this uh, but you have to be very careful about how that other bank is actually involved. Do they have priority to the loan that we're giving or do we have priority of repayment to the investors versus their loan and those things? Um, that That's what actually has to be looked at with these different types of financial structures because you know it's very important for the immigration process to hit. As mentioned, we have 100% approval uh, track record investors obtaining their permanent residency. That's very important. But it's just as important to get your $800,000 back, right? And so I think that's what you have to do as an EB-5 investor is look at the EB-5 investment from two perspectives. One, can I get my permanent residency through this investment? And two, can I get my money back? Um, and as Sonia mentioned, we'd be more than glad to talk to you about that um, as you reach out to us. And that's what I would like to close with. And Neil and Sonia, if you'd like to add any uh, closing statements here. Once again, thank you so much for participating again with us, Neil. We truly appreciate it. And, and please feel free to add any closing statements that yeah, uh, you sure. would like. No, absolutely. No, no. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Manuel, and uh, Sonia as well. And yeah, look, I mean, 
I've, I've, I've seen quite a few South African investors successfully exit out of uh, uh, EB5. In fact, they got their money back. They got their investment back. They very happily um, reside in the U.S. and uh, move has been good, and and yeah, look, and it's it's it can be quite a minefield. And fortunately, you know, I was for, fortunate to be involved with the U.S. Invest Conference. Of course, Sonia was there. You went at F First Pathway Partners at that particular time, but uh, I, I managed to to meet the other guys. <laughs> So I had the opportunity of sort of having a helicopter view of, you know, what's what's on show. And it's quite interesting. It's not only real estate, you know, these trucking businesses and there's a whole lot of other sort of opportunities, which I thought, well, you know, if you're not a real estate person, it becomes very difficult to understand those kind of, you know, opportunities. And I think first pathway partners, I think the, the key is, you know, you mentioned the whole due diligence process, you know, you know, having an expert like yourself to help you and guide you. And the project that you got is seems really top quality projects. So, and uh, and you haven't actually mentioned one or two of your projects because it's probably worthwhile mentioning some of those real estate projects that you have because compared to the rest, it's some really top quality stuff. And, um, and then, yeah, look, I think in terms of that, the jobs you create, I understand from that because that's, I think it's an incredible program. Um, you know, I don't understand why in South Africa they wouldn't do something like that for investors. Take, I don't think they've even thought about it. In fact, I think they're trying to chase everybody to the US. So I think we're trying to do the opposite <laughs> of what the, the EB5 is happening. But uh, I think it's an incredible program. And uh, and yeah, so, I, I, you know, I like the real estate side of things. And, and it's, it is good to hear that I know that people that have invested in EB5 after their five year, they got their money back. So it's, I, I, look, there, there, there has been one or two, some reports where some people have not got the same. So, you know, they have been indifferent. But the program itself, I, 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 it's really a good program. And I think you guys are driving, you know, your particular quality type um, projects that you've got, I think, really um, top quality stuff. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And I think you bring up some really good points. Uh, the way that the U.S. government designed the program is that the investor funds have to be at risk, um, but that doesn't mean that you can't structure the project in a conservative way to protect the investors. And, and I think that's what's really important. And you mentioned some of our previous projects. I'm actually staying at one here. I'm in uh, okay. California this week, and uh, I'm staying here at uh, JW Marriott uh, project um, that we did uh, you know, some, some years ago where it's a 10 minute walk to Disneyland. So I won't be wearing any mouse ears today, <laughs> uh, I've got some meetings after this, but uh, it just speaks to the type of quality projects that we actually do. And Sonia, if you'd like to add anything as well, please go ahead. Sure. So I've also stayed at one of our projects uh, when I went over, you know, to the office and I went to see my son graduate uh, you know, from the Navy. So I stayed uh, in the Kempton. Kempton was amazing. Uh, the rooms are large. And um, I didn't quite understand. They had a little dog, or a blackboard, and they had names on. And some of our projects, you can actually bring your dogs with you. And they're really treated with royal treatment. So that I found really unusual. And um, yes, so I had the privilege of actually going around and looking at some of our projects. Um, they are on our website. You know, we've done a loft, as Manuel said, we've done Marriott. And we've also partnered with uh, a lot of really, really big developers, you know, so they've had a lot of skin in the projects as well. And um, yeah, and also um, ultra luxury developments, you know, I think uh, are in high demand and a lot of the areas are outdated. I think a lot of areas need new accommodation and uh, get away from the Airbnbs because uh, there is no accommodation available, you know, in certain areas. And um, yes, I'm, I'm very excited uh, to actually go and see the new development that we've got. So hopefully I'll be lucky enough to do that. But Manuel is also there. He meets everybody in the United States to take a trip out there and uh, go to our offices anytime. And Manuel takes people on tours and, you know, you get a real good feel for, you know, what it's all about. So I just want to encourage you, if you are looking at uh, getting permanent residency or even citizenship, you know, after a five-year period, um, come and talk to us. Uh, we'll be happy to assist you. 
And thank you, Neil, again. And thank you, Manuel. Thank you for today. Yes. Thank you. Thank you both. Truly appreciate it. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And thank you once again. Everybody have a great day. You should.